Hey guys, I'm back with another endgame tutorial. This time is a rook endgame where the stronger side is up two pawns. So this is the most difficult scenario being up two pawns because one of the pawns is a rook pawn. And with rook pawns there is always a chance for a stalemate for the defending side. So this position is taken from Jeremy Silman's book Complete Endgame Course from Beginner to Master. So a general rule to keep in mind uh, in these endings is to keep your king and pawns as close to each other as possible and slowly advance them. So you can see in this position that white's h-pawn is far ahead of the pack. So here white plays king to h3, getting the king closer to the h-pawn. So here black played king to f6. Best try for black is to keep this king in front of these pawns and to use the rook and harass white's king. So here white played g3 in the book. So g4 wins as well, but for the sake of keeping things nice and methodical, let's play the move g3. So here rook to f1. The safe way for white to push forward is first to lead with the h-pawn, followed by his king and then the g-pawn. So the good thing about delaying the push of the g-pawn is that you give the king a flight square in case of checks on the h-file. So here white played king to g4 and this takes control of the squares in front of the enemy king. And this is another thing that you should always try to do is to push the king backwards. So now rook to d6 is a threat. Rook to f2 and rook d6. So king to e7 was played in the book. King to e5 isn't so good for black because then the king is completely cut off from defending the promotion squares. So king to e7, rook to a6, white keeps the rook as far away as possible from the enemy king. So here rook to b2, black is preparing to give checks. And now king h4 getting ready to push the g-pawn and also meeting rook b4 with uh, g4. So here black went king f7, g4, king to g7, and h6. So you can see that you always lead with the h-pawn. King h7, king h5, and you can see again the reason for delaying the g-pawn is after rook b5, you can play the move g5. And if rook uh, here to h2, then there's king to g5. So black carried on with his resistance with rook b5 check. White played g5, continuing to advance and make progress. And here, white pushed the king backwards. Rook a7, king to h8. So if king to h8 in this position, then you go rook to e7. And I'll explain this move in a bit. But what happens if black goes king to g8? Then you go rook g7, and if king h8, then rook back to e7 transposes back to the main line. But if uh, rook g7, king, h, uh, king to f8, then you go king g6, and if rook c6 check, king to h7, and this wins easily for white, since you now control the queening square with your king. And this rook shields the king from any potential checks on the 7 rank. So all that white needs to do now is to step the rook out of the way and just push uh, the g-pawn. So back to the main line, rook e7. You might be thinking, what does this move accomplish? Well, one of white's goals is to bring his king over to the 7 rank, and he will be safely shielded by the rook. So this move also helps in assisting the king towards a 7 rank where it can block incoming checks. So for example, if king to g8, where black keeps the pin on the g-pawn, then king g6, black can give a few checks, but white will eventually intercept with the rook. And here white should play g6. I will explain the purpose of this move in a bit. So going back to the main line, here black played rook to c8. So the next step for white is to play g6, 
And I should mention that you don't really want to play the move h7, even though it might work in some cases, but this uh, is a bit risky because it always allows still mating ideas from the defending side. So here black can play rook to c7, and if that is taken, then it's still mate. The pawn guards g8, and the, the rook guards the 7th rank. So here, what if rook, uh, rook c7, rook to e6? So king, to, uh, king takes h7, and this is a well-known drawn ending. So back uh, to the main line, g6. So what this does is that it creates a constant back rank mating threat that black has to worry about, because these pawns control g7 and h7, so black always has to keep an eye out for a rook to e8 mate. So it's true that white's king is kind of exposed in this position, but it doesn't really matter. Black can give a few checks, but white gets closer to his goal of uh, coming to the 7th rank. So here, rook to c8. Well, black can continue checking, but then white gets to f7. So here, rook c8, king to e6, rook a8. So here, rook to d7. Well, getting to f7 was our goal for quite a while. So king to f7, this prepares white for the next idea, which is to trade rooks with rook to e8. But this doesn't really work because here rook to f8, and you have to go back to e6 because if you take, then this is going to be stalemate. And this is also one of the tricks that you should watch out for. So here going back uh, to the main line, rook to d7. And what this does is this frees up the e7 square and prepares white for the next phase, which is to trade rooks. So here rook e8 check, king f7, rook to g8, and this is the most stubborn defense. So if rook to f8 in this position, trying for the stalemate idea, simply king to e7, this only helps white. And now rook to d8 is unavoidable. So rook g8, so this stops white from going king e7 because then the pawn of g6 would fall. But here white wins with the move g7 check. So another very simple win is just to waste a tempo, say rook d5, and then black would have to move its rook, rook f8, king e7, and rook d8 is unavoidable. But let's look at g7 check, king to h7, and now rook e7, preparing rook e8, so rook a8, if king takes h6, then the rook is undefended. So rook to a8, rook e8, rook a7 check, king f8, and white is going to simply promote the pawn. So that is all for this video, guys. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.